and welcome back to D and J's epic adventure uh, quest. I mean, epic quest. I'm Justin. This is Derek, and you're already throwing me under the bus here. I was going to apologize for fucking that up last time, but uh, I guess we're I guess we're even now. Yep, yep. Uh, I last minute thought I was just like, you know what? I'm going to introduce us wrong and then correct it. <laughs> <laughs> since i did not last time right uh you know beginning of the fo- podcast uh first time doing it maybe well, uh some first first time jitters i suppose yeah first time blunders so to speak not a huge deal right no not at all i don't think anybody is going to notice um outside of you and your wife and me it's all good. We got the records. We got the record straight. So, uh, what was your what was your impression of this uh, this chapter one of Gardens of the Moon here? Hands down, it's the best chapter that we've read in this book so far. It's the only chapter we've read in this book. Our prologue yes. technically chapters. I don't see. You can't disagree with me though. Not yeah. yet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess we'll have to wait till next episode. Next episode. <laughs> um, I did like it a lot. There's for the amount of pages in this chapter, which was what forty ish, not quite fifty. Uh, yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. Third, like high thirties, low forties, somewhere in there. There was uh, definitely a lot that happened, but it seemed to be pretty self-contained to one area. Um, so we weren't running all over yet. Um, so I appreciated that. I liked just kind of getting the lay of the land, so to speak. Right. And we're, you know, we're introduced, we're being introduced to uh, some of the, the, the theories and speculation that we had when we did the prologue. Um, what, what is happening? Some of those things are being revealed, uh, which we'll touch on as we go through this podcast, I thought it was really interesting uh, the way that this chapter was laid out. Uh, from what I understand from some of the, the typical fantasy tropes is that like small village characters are slowly introduced. That's kind of been the format for fantasy books. It was really kind of cool to see this take a different approach. Yeah, we didn't really get that, did we? It was kind of it in like right into big it. Big open space, just a big open space. We don't really know where we are, right? Like we haven't, you know, established any environment. Um, some of that, you know, happens as you go through the chapter, but it's not. It's not this thing that is generated and built up prior to getting into the story, which I thought was cool. Right. We see quite so, a bit of characters too. Yeah, we had I don't know, probably eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there. I think mean, yeah, ten to fifteen. So this chapter picked up seven years after the prologue. So I know I remember one thing I had kind of thought was that it uh just with how young the I guess I can't really say main character of the prologue, but um, one of the characters in the prologue seemed awfully young um, for the type of environment this book is going to be. And we do run into that character in this chapter, and they are seven years old or so. Um, by all means, a man grown now for this story. It still puts him at 19 years old, though. Like, today's terms, still fairly young. Yeah, but 18, you're an adult, right? I mean... They're still a kid, but you're legally an adult. Right. Very true. The chapter kind of starts off uh, with, we have kind of these two unnamed characters, one very young girl and then another older and described as gnarled and bony woman uh, standing the hag. by the side. Right. Yeah. You know, hag, town hag standing by the side of the road uh watching a column of soldiers on men and women on horseback 
coming down this this slope. Yeah, mostly uh, mostly men. One thing I did pick up on was, uh, you know, the mention of women that were riding in this column uh, appeared to be more fierce than the men. That was one thing that stuck with me when I read it. Um, and then that the uh, the young girl was awestruck, you know, by this. I don't know if you want to call it a parade, but it's kind of what it seemed to be. And this old woman was just kind of there, you know, she's waiting for it to pass. She's seen this before. Um, she even talks about it. Um, she's, she sent three husbands and two sons off to war and um, they did not return home. So this, this doesn't appear to impress her. Uh, like it does the young girl who, you know, is from this village and probably hasn't been anywhere in her life yet. I also thought it was interesting you're bringing up the, the father and the sons uh, of this old hag. Uh, but she says a couple of, of lines that, for whatever reason, it's just really drawn to. Prod and pull. I think it was the very first three words that uh, the chapter opens up with. And this old woman who whose name we find out is, is Riga is comparing Lacine to the gods with this statement. So I'm curious as to see what Prod and Paul, like if that comes back in future chapters and maybe unraveled a little bit as to like, is there a meaning behind prod and pull? Um, well, I mean, we see it at the end of this chapter even, and it, I've got thoughts on that. And when we get there, um, well, I'll definitely share my thoughts with you. Uh, and we'll see how we compare on that. I'm good with that. Scattering bones is the other one. Now that you're talking about uh, the sons and the father. But I, I wrote down, uh, like, <clears throat> is this Riga's way of having an analogy to death killing, right? Like scattering of bones. And then again, she associates it all started. She like says something that says this all started when Lacine killed the emperor. She was the one who started the scattering of the bones. Yeah, I think at least what I took from it was that, uh, you know, Lacine just started killing anyone and everyone and didn't care. She was, you know, it was a power grab, it sounds like, and she was going to come out on top and it didn't care who was hurt by that. Also, I and we'll touch on this later, but throughout this chapter, there's a lot of like hood, H-O-O-D, hood this, hood that, hood gates hoods roast you know um i know i noticed that too and my thought is that that must be the name of one of the gods yeah because it almost sounds like a i don't know that a curse would be the right word or the right thing you know but like it's some type of it's oath. just how it feels to me some type of like almost like a <laughs> like a god damn it type thing i i interpret it as like hell you know, like hell's roast, hell's gates, you know, um, just type of, yeah, I don't know. I got a location out of it, like some type of like fiery damnation. <clears throat> but anyway, no worries, off off a little bit. But yeah, I just, I, I thought that the whole prodded pole and the scattering of bones, I thought it was interesting how Lucine ties that back into like almost like making fun of the current empress. Or like taking small little like verbal jag like jabs at her. Yeah, that, that you know I I think uh, she's not a fan. Um, but maybe um, if you want, I can just kind of quick quickly uh, run down this this part of the chapter here, and then um, if you want to go on to the the other parts, or we can talk about this first part here a little bit more in depth, but. Um, I guess just kind of the events of this 
this first perspective, you know, we've talked about some of it already, but we have this old woman and young girl standing on the side of the road. And the picture you get is the, uh, the soldiers are taking up so much of the road that have to stand on, you know, basically the side of the road and they're inches away from falling down into the ditch. There's just not any room. And the young girl, you know, is, is mesmerized by this, I don't think it's big enough for an army, but a unit of soldiers, you know, going by. And it must be quite a few. It takes some time. Um, and Riga, you know, is is talking to this girl, and the girl's not really paying a whole lot of attention because she's just infatuated with all the soldiers walking, you know, riding their horses. Eventually, the little girl, the young girl, says, well, isn't this wonderful? And Riga just gets pissed and grabs her by the hair and essentially starts yelling at her and, and tells her about how this country used to be free. Uh, the name of the country, Itko Khan, um, they used to fly their flag and it used to be free. And then uh, Riga kind of goes into, it almost seems like a trance, uh, has a, I guess, a, a prophecy. Um, Riga, Riga led the seer, then let me find the exact quote here. Because it was kind of interesting, and there was part of it that I just stared at for a good few minutes, um, looking at it. I did the same. It's a very, it's a very interesting way of describing or detailing out the cadence. So the I, I, I wonder if if we're looking at the same part. But the quote here is. Uh, Regal of the seer, the wax witch who trapped souls in candles and burned them, souls devoured in, the, in flame. Um, Riga's words carried a chilling tone of prophecy. Mark this truth. I am the last to speak to you. You are the last to hear me. Thus we are linked, you and I, beyond all else. And then there's a second part to this. Across the sea, the empress has driven her knife into virgin soil. The blood now comes in a tide and it'll sweep you under, child. If you're not careful, they'll put a sword in your hand. They'll give you a fine horse and they'll send you across that sea. But a shadow will embrace your soul. Now listen, bury this deep. Riga will preserve you because we are linked, you and I. But it is all I can do, understand? Look to the Lord spawned in darkness. His hand that shall free you, though he'll not know, know it not. Uh, and then she's cut off and a soldier that's passing by. Um, yells at her, backs hand, backhands her with a uh, chain mail fist and essentially kills her. So the, well, I'll continue, I'll come back to that. Um, one of the, so the soldier stops or another soldier stops and helps up the young girl and tells her that, you know, it, it really wasn't a waste of a life. Um, but we get to the end of the column of soldiers and the young girl's collecting herself from, you know, a lot just transpired in a few minutes. You got a big column of soldiers and you just watch this woman die in front of you. Collapsing um, on you in your lap. Bleeding all over you. Exactly. And uh, suddenly we have these two mysterious men show up. They're hooded, they're cloaked, um, and we don't know where they came from. And at this point, the sun is setting, so they're very, like, hard cast shadows, like, wanning shadows, uh, concealing the inside of their hoods, th their faces. Yep. Yeah, just very mysterious. So this, this girl is telling these men that... Uh, you know, Riga was a good woman and she burned these candles every night for her husbands and her sons. And one of the men says, no, they're for necromancy. But suddenly uh, we get this, I guess, portal that opens up or Warren, as they call it in the book. And we get seven huge hounds uh, that come out of this uh, tear in space time, whatever you want to call it. And uh, it, it's pretty apparent that, uh, you know, we now have some wizards or sorcerers, whatever term you want to call them, you know, that they just uh, ripped a hole into the air and uh, was able to pull out these hellhounds out. <laughs> and uh, 
these hounds bound off after the call of the soldiers and you just hear the slaughter that happens down the road. And uh, so after that, we find out, we get, we get some names from these mystery men. We have Cotillion and Amanus. Which is the shorter uh, one. I'm not sure is Amanus was he the one who opened Correct. and brought forth the hounds? Okay, I was Cotillion sure was that. the one that extended his hand to help this fisher girl out. All Amanus right. was the shorter one <clears throat> that opened up the, the warren to allow the hounds. So they they re- literally released the hounds, and uh, then uh, we're trying to decide what to do with this young girl, whether you know uh, to kill her because she she knows their names and with what just happened, she's a liability, or do they use her um, for their their own ends? And this is this is kind of where I have some thoughts, um, and even if it's. I don't know, like a, a double cross almost, but um, you talked about that prod and pull and this young girl says that to these two men at one point in their conversation, she says prod and pull. So um, the part that I really stared at and looked at when Riga was giving her little prophecy was the line she said, I will be the last to speak to you because this girl very clearly was not killed. And other people are speaking to her. We know that Riga was a seer. Um, She could play with some dark magic. I feel like somehow Riga transposed herself into this young girl um, who has a little bit more to play later on in this chapter. Well, I guess we'll see, you know, was it just a uh, impulse where she said these words, these same words that Riga said, or is it a... uh, you know, did Riga assume a new identity in this young girl? That's kind of, that was kind of what I thought. I went about it, I I chose the word possession. You know, I think Riga says that we are now linked in her prophecy that she has spoken to this Fisher girl. Uh, So I'm wondering if, are they sharing? Because there's that perspective of, she says something in kind of an old hag type tone and then the next sentence after she snaps out of it so to speak she's her young voice carrying a different tone so i don't know if it's just this like suppressed thing that riga riga has put herself into this girl to come out as she pleases like is she is soul trapped inside of this young girl's body, uh, which is interesting because uh, Amanus, I can't remember if it was Amanus or uh, Cotillion, is talking about how he can smell, smell the souls in the candle. So, and he also brings up, he also brings up that she traps these souls in candles and then burns the can- excuse me and then burns the candles he, he said he could hear hear them i don't know maybe if he said smell them i missed it but he said he could hear them sorry he hear. could hear the souls calling calling for riga that's what it is yes my apology uh mixed I'm up sorry to me. interrupt you no no it's cool i it's it's just kind of funny that like he can smell god why do i say smell it's the hounds it's the hounds uh dogs right it's, <laughs> so he hears the he hears the souls in these candles burning and he makes some comments about necromancy as you mentioned but my question is is what is what is riga doing because it kind of sounds like torture to me like she's trapping these souls and then she's burning these candles uh what is that like is that sorcery is that like mage is that just i know that they brought up gifts slash talents like seer necromancer sage sorcery you know are there different levels of of magic so to speak or are is it like there's this hierarchy of of magic and sorcery there's different levels, different powers, and then there's like gifts, like small little things that 
a relatable, but maybe not as powerful. I don't know. Those are just some of the thoughts that I had as I was reading that particular perspective, that opening to this chapter. Yeah, there's just a lot we don't know yet about how, like, the you know, there's obviously some sort of magic in this, and we don't know enough about it yet. Also, with the hounds, what did you envision? Like, gigantic fucking Doberman pinchers ripping people apart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine at first I thought because like I didn't catch the you know the gateway opening the Warren so to speak tiny Warrens anyway I imagine them as spiritual ghostly like phantom hounds but I'm curious is that the case or are they just physical hounds? Uh, I mean we know that they didn't find any footprints or anything, right. but that it's kind of like. Uh in the uh wheel of time what are the the shadow hounds what are they i can't remember what they're dark called hounds. exactly there dark hounds that should have been obvious um they don't leave a footprint except on concrete so it could be something like that too i suppose we just don't know yet but um, you know and this it sounds like this slaughter just took place in an open field yeah we know a manis the one who summons a dog the dogs or the hounds uh, clearly some type of sorcerer, but what about Cotillion? We haven't, there really isn't anything that alludes to him wielding sorcery or using sorcery or magic. I think they most, most, both must be to some extent. Um, That's what I thought maybe, too. Maybe he's just not as strong in the, in his power. I thought it was interesting the way that this perspective wraps up though is because they're both talking about her being the pawn of the gods like i'm not sure and obviously i'm sure that more of this will be revealed but i'm it's just it captured my intrigue as where 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 what could this fisher girl possibly have to do with being a pawn it does seem well, I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. That's the point of podcasts. Uh, it does seem, though, that Cotillion and uh, Amanus have some type of vendetta against Lucene. What? We have no idea. But they, she's clearly, or they're clearly against her. He, I, yes, I agree. And um, just kind of the sense that I gathered was that this girl is just so plain looking that nobody would suspect her for whatever means they mean to use her as you know um, an assassin or whatever it is um because they're like i can't remember the exact line but um you know they said that she's she's ideal they can well here it is she's ideal the empress could never track her down could never even so much as a guess um yeah it's right before that quote you know, that you were just talking about. It's not so bad a thing, Laz, to be the pawn of a god. So I think, you know, uh, Cotillion and Amanus must be working on behalf of one of the gods or the god in this world uh, to take out Lacine. And this is just is uh, a Jane Doe, basically. Right. Is she Is she like this, though? Is she this Jane Doe? or pawn to the gods because of Riga? Or is she is she a pawn because of, of just whatever it is that they, they see in her? You know, like it makes me wonder if what Riga did with this possession or this, you know, uh, soul parasiting, that this is the reason why she's a pawn or could be a pawn. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to find out. I suppose really it could go either way. But just her saying, you know, the last, the last uh, quote we get in this perspective is the Fisher girl saying, "Prod and pull quickly," and it it got Cotillion's attention that she said that, and that's that's what makes me think something is up. Like there's and, and throughout the chapter, it really alludes to Riga and this Fisher girl being connected in some way, not just within this perspective, but like tiny little tidbits throughout the first chapter i i really i really enjoyed this perspective it was really kind of cool to be 
to be thrown into, you know, the wizardry and the sorcery and, you know, a, a couple of these characters we know nothing about, but are still very incap- captivating uh, to read about and wanting to know more. So uh, I, th- I think that the author did a fantastic job of pulling in a, a reader very, very quickly. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you want to take what's up next here? Yeah, the following morning, we see uh, a lot of unnamed characters, <laughs> an unnamed captain on horseback next to what is the adjunct of the emperor, Empress Lucine. Uh, we find out that her name is Lorne. They are walking up this hillside towards a, what they call a promontory, which is just land that is jutting out into open water and i imagined that it's a hill that they're walking up and then a depression which we'll get to and then kind of another rise on the opposite side of that uh both of these characters are walking towards i guess you could say the highest peak there are soldiers waiting for them on the road and lorne asks asks the captain something about surviving the purge and then the captain makes a comment about the noble born if he if he were noble born he wouldn't have survived the purge which will kind of come back to that but i thought that that was really interesting uh as i feel like a lot of things mention nobility so i think that there's something there with nobility but as these characters are, you know, ascending the slope, we, the captain and Lorne, the adjunct to the, the empress, get to where they're supposed to go. And who do they see across, across the way? None only than the one familiar character, which is Gnose Peron, the Perrin. The captain and the, the, the Lorne, adjunct of the empress kind of call him over and are all like hey what did you what did you find what did you discover and i think he says something about let me show you what he does show them is just a uh i remember just you know it's it was a a field and it was just blackened with birds and and uh something spooks the birds and just you know it's like a wave you know it just like completely changes everything you couldn't see anything but for the birds on this uh, field eating, you know, the, these massacred people and horses and everything else. Yeah, here it is. Uh, so the Lorne and Lorne is like, who is that over there yonder? And the captain was like, let's bring him over. And so he's being told to, you know, come up here, join Lorne and, and this commander. Basically, Paran or Gnoz says, like, hey, there's a, you know, there's a small fishing village down here. As, as you alluded to, there's, in this field or depression, are just wheeling pigeons and crows and ravens and birds of just picking and gnawing at flesh, horse flesh. There is some speculation as to what, what took place. And one of them makes a comment about wolves. Paran Gnose, Gnose Paran, is asked in his opinion what took place. And he says this is something physical. Like, Lorne... Nat- natural weapons. Natural weapons. And Lorne and the captain were like, well, what do you mean? And he was just like, claws, teeth, natural weapons. But they didn't find anything. Not, you know. It, I, can you imagine the number of wolves to kill 400 people and not not leave a trace behind, not a footprint, not a fur ball, anything? <laughs> right. It's you just know? blood, flesh. And I mean, not, not just people, like horses too. Horses just dying, being pecked for food from, you know, these... Uh, you know 
scavenger birds. Right. They're, uh, you know, they know something is afoot that, uh, you know, it's, it was a completely 100% lopsided fight. Oh, absolutely. And um, one of the things that Lauren asked the lieutenant as is, you know, has it been contained? Like, does anybody know about what, about this, the slaughter fest, you know, to which the captain says, no, like everything's been contained. Nobody's talked, et cetera. Ganoz also reports in the fishing village that there's a couple of empty huts, one belonging to an old woman, which I take is the hag Riga in this in this description, and then also an empty hut for a woman, a young woman and or a young girl and her father, which I assume is the fisher girl from the previous perspective and her father yes i agree with that i think that's exactly what those two are that's what we're led to believe anyways so essentially what happens is uh, Gano's escorts lorne through this this field of horse bodies death death but yeah right um like so much so that you can't even you can't like i think that they described that the pavement underneath was like a reddish brick and there wasn't much to see of that reddish brick because of all of the mangled bodies and the birds pecking out eyes. And it was, it was, it's so descriptive. It was cool to read. I think uh, one of the things that, you know, tells me how bad this is when uh, Gano says, I'm not young anymore. You know, after, after what he saw, he's, it's aged him up a bit. I was curious about that because to me, he's 19 years old, but now that you make that point, I'm like, okay, yeah, I see, I see where you're going there. Yeah, it's not something a, a kid should see, and he saw something he shouldn't have had to see at, you know, his age. Exactly. So during this, I guess, excur- excursion with Lorne and, and Gano's, G- Lorne says something. So, okay, this is what this is what she said. So she goes, if that man and his daughter had been out fishing, they'd have come in with the tide. And then Gnose is like, but, and then is very quickly interrupted by Lorne, you won't find their bodies, Lieutenant. It sounds like to me and in, in how I'm interpreting this, this perspective is they're essentially looking for survivors. They're looking for signs of life and... <clears throat> Lauren make makes the association that like hey this is a fishing village their bodies aren't in this carnage because these are all soldiers and and horses and their mounts so to speak but down in the village there's nobody there either if they they were likely out fishing their bodies would have came in with the tide I, i i guess to me i think she meant that their boat would have just came in with the tide you know when for the end of the day um, I guess that's how I took it. Gotcha. That Not makes, necessarily that, sense, that they were too. killed out at sea. My question is, is just like, how, how does Lorne know about the girl and the dad? Like, maybe that's something that I missed. They had the two huts. I think she found out from, was it Ganoas who, you know, said that they found the two huts. One was right. the old woman. And then they mentioned the other one, you know, an old man and a, a young, a young girl. And that's based on the things that were like inside the hut that Gano's found. I just, I think it's a little too convenient that these are the only two huts that don't have anybody in them, so to speak. I don't know if the other huts had dead people in them. I don't remember reading that, but. Uh, I guess I don't particularly remember either. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. No worries. Going back to what Lauren was talking about with the captain about the purge. My question is, do you remember in the prologue when there was a siege happening at Voxhold and the mouse quarter? I think that time frame was when that purge was happening because Lucine was taking hold of power at that point. And then sometime shortly after that, you know, must have ordered the uh, killing of you know, anybody who would oppose her or, you know, any kids or you know children who could uh have a claim to whatever throne she took i think it has something to do with nobility though because 
the captain says to Lorne, he makes a comment to her that if he was noble born, he wouldn't have survived the purge. So is right, the, she would have had him killed. Right. And if you remember in the prologue, the mouse quarter was the poorest in that city. Yes. So I guess just in the event that this captain was in mouse quarters, he would have been, you know, spared because because he's yeah, he says he, you know he, he rose up to his position, you know, coming up through the ranks in the military. I just I just thought it was cool that there was that small maybe reference or just that aha moment that click that maybe these two events are related maybe we'll find out more yeah i I think they definitely go hand in hand i think you know lacine she took over and there's obviously people that are pissed about it and it sounds like now they're clapping back at her uh you know it might it it almost seems like guerrilla warfare a little bit you know you're unleashing these hounds on people and nobody (laughs) nobody saw them coming nobody knows where they went just a sneaky surprise, but it was yes. it was so cool uh, how these two perspectives lined up. Because when I first started reading the second perspective, I'm like, "Where is this going?" Like it's just these two people on a horse talking about his the captain's history in this land, which we find out he's very inexperienced because where his legion and garrison are has seen very little action as far as like Lucine's conquest. I think they mentioned something about being there for eight years. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but. <laughs> That's all right. So, but it, after this, oh, go ahead. <laughs> last, last little tie in to the nobility thing. Um, the captain of Lucine's guard in the prologue recognizes Gnose as pure blood, right? Or noble nobility. So if again, if this is what the purge is supposed to be doing is eliminating nobility, why is Gnose spared? I mean she even he even interacts with Lucine in the prologue. There must have been some houses or families that, you know, were on her side, I would assume, you know, that that supported her claim or her usurping right i would assume but i you know again i just kind of like the the whole (laughs) tying things together i thought that was cool or that at least it made sense to me we will find out more i'm sure of that and then it was said that 175 men and women and 210 horses slaughtered by the hounds it's a lot and that was just military that was just military people correct uh yeah and then they're talked about civilians basically and the number was 400 plus and counting um for diversion basically so i'm sure we're going to run into something bigger here and we just don't know what that is yet right like something something's taking place and one you know lauren doesn't want to talk about it doesn't want anything to kind of get out about this but i thought it was interesting uh you know, on their way back to the captain, Lauren is talking about how she speculates that this might have something to do with sorcery. And Gnose makes the comment about like, oh, well, you hunt them. You like track them down. Is that what, is that what you're here to do? Like she, like he is questioning her ethics here, her moral fiber, so to speak, around sorcery. It kind of seems like she is one herself. Well, she she doesn't give him a straight answer. She just, you know, like you said, she says you just hunt them and down and kill them. And let's see, uh, Lauren says, "Don't interrupt me again." But she does talk about how she has a relationship with magic, though she doesn't practice it herself. Right. So that makes me think, like, does she? I, I feel like I wrote something. Oh, yeah. Lauren can see or sense magic, but doesn't use it or can use it. Is it just a? Is it just a? Look, she sees it. Or is this uh, she can use it? I know that she mentions that she doesn't practice it. So is that a choice or is that an you know inability? Well, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure yet. Uh, I feel like I feel like we talked a lot on this one as well, and you know, rightfully so. The center of both of these perspectives are 
the you know the annihilation of a militia a militia of some kind yeah i think the other big thing that happens is that uh Gano's is conscripted into lauren's service yes um, but she doesn't really reveal why you know what i mean she doesn't really make it known as to why Gano's is being pulled into her service it doesn't really give kind of felt like it was answers he, th- he thought he was going to get this cushy job in the city, you know, not doing much. And I felt like it was, she was just kind of throwing him a big fuck you. I'm going to give you some shit now. Right. You know, you're going to get the, the nitty gritty and the dirty stuff here. Maybe not, but that's kind of what it felt like. I think that Lauren just sees her, or sees, God, I want to keep calling him her, keeps seeing him as useful or resourceful, but she never really gives him like a straight answer as to why he's pulled in. He's, you know, we find out that he's proud of himself, you know, like he's doing well, he's promoted, you know, doing more. Right. But yeah, I feel like we've covered the, the, the major, the major points of that perspective. The next one here is, you know, we kind of walk into a, a uh, recruiting drive and, who do we run across but a young girl of 12 or 13 years old, but um, her eyes look older, um, which is, you know, another hint, I think, that, you know, like you said, maybe Riga is possessing this young body. But this recruiter's been directed to take anybody with two arms, two legs, and a head to draft them into the service. So it, it it's... He's hesitant to do it, you know, because he thinks about his kids. You know, if he had a kid that age, there's, you know, there's no way in hell he'd let this fly. But this isn't his kid, so uh, more or less, she's just a body, uh, cannon fodder, to be thrown into the, uh, to be thrown into hell. Uh, yeah. So and then so the the uh, recruiter asked for her name. And she says, sorry, my name is sorry. And uh, which is an odd name, but I'm sure he realizes that it's not a real name, but it's not his job to care. Right. But if you remember from, you know, Amanus and Cotillion, they had a little uh, spat, so to speak, about what to name her. And Cotillion was like, well, she's mine. I found her. I get to name her. So true. I'm assuming this is what he named her, although nothing has specifically said this is what they named her. Or if this is this Fisher girl, who knows? I have a feeling it is. I think so. I I'll, I I think it is too, but there was also something about uh where Riga says her father only has one arm, more bones for to be scattered, and sorry requests to be in high fist dujiks one arms uh, company or whatever host. And it's kind of odd that uh, the commander she wants to be positioned under is named one arm and her father has one arm. I never put those two together. Really? No, I didn't catch that. What? I know. Not at all? No, I didn't catch that. I am pathetic. I was a little, I thought it was kind of on the nose. I was like, I, I see you. I'm looking for the quote, but I feel like this recruiter, the staff sergeant Aragon, Aragon, uh, has met Riga. Oh, right. Uh, look, it's the second paragraph in. The old woman was right as usual. These people had been under the boot so long they actually liked it, and I feel like Riga at the beginning of the book mentioned something very, very quickly about being under a boot. I could be imagining it, but I feel like I read something similar to that. So I feel like before the slaughter happened that Riga had met Aragon, the sergeant staff recruiter dude, because I feel like he's mentioning her, Riga, as he's saying that. Could have, I missed that then, or I didn't pick up on it either. See, one of the two. So you had one, I had one. <laughs> well, 
we're even. It was. It's on page twenty nine, the second paragraph. The old woman was right. There you go. Yeah, that makes sense. So then we move on to back to Ganos, and he's uh, been sent to a the the town basically where Jeram the fishing village. The fishing, the villagers would sell their catch. Right. The city was called Jaram. It's located inland, is what they said, along the uh, Ichko Khan Road, an old thoroughfare or thorough through. As he's walking to this town, there is evidence of what he would call a mass exodus, right? So fruit dried up uh things scattered all over the roadway i think the author did use the word detritus i love that word uh to describe detritus 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 to describe you know the contents left on this road to this town yeah it just seems abandoned right he gets he essentially gets there and it's in a very small village slash town it's literally a t-shaped road with buildings on the side and he gets to one which i would assume is an inn of some sorts and ties up his his horse walks in and whoa met with again the moving floor of birds pecking and eating at flesh so he just walks into this scene like miniature scene of horror where i can assume everybody in this village the small market town is been moved into this inn everybody's dead everybody's dead yeah and he's shook up by it that you know he calls it a horrific day even so it's you know you can tell it got to him yeah he got under his skin quite a bit the constabulary is what I would assume, or is what the inn is called, the Constabulary. Constabulary. Yeah, I guess I wasn't sure if that was the name of it or if that was just kind of a general name for the, you know, that type of a building. I don't know that I'd ever heard that word before personally. What Detritus or Constabulary? Yes, that one. I think it's just a name. All right, we'll go with that. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Uh, there's this like thought that he has. He goes, a conjuring of birds to keep mocking vigil. Dark humor's not to my liking anymore, I think. I don't quite understand what that thought is really pertaining to, but maybe he's, maybe, I don't know, had jokes or dark humor rhetoric around the uh, death and now it's just like now that he's seen it he's not really into dark humor anymore yeah you know maybe when he's younger it was you know yet and he hadn't encountered it it was you know a joke and now it's he's dealing with it firsthand and he realizes that it isn't something that's that's funny and um you know a couple pages later you know he's as he's walking through all this death he he has uh this recollection um of words from seven years before uh you know live quietly and he rejected it that notion then and he rejected it still um so it you can see you know those words that the military officer gave him when he was 12 years old rang true some but he's he's fighting it he's rejecting it you know he he doesn't want to live quietly you can see he's he wants to be, you know, a hero, but, you know, it's, at, it, you can see, he's starting to see that there's a price to it. Look at all these dead bodies he's encountering and, uh, I, you know, makes me wonder if he's wondering if it's worth it. Kind of, you know, second guessing himself a little bit. I, I, I take yeah, this, yeah, you know, sure. like, what did I get myself into? Like, this is a terrible day. Because, you know, kind of leading into the next part here is after he, he quickly gets out of there. He's like, fuck this. I'm dude, done. Like, I can't handle this anymore. Like, I'm out. And he starts to walk back towards, 
again, I would assume Lorne. Uh, but, you know, he's he's going through all of this that you've brought up, this you know, horrific day, all of the events that have transpired, and also just kind of what he wants, what what he wants himself. And he states he wants more than the life, like as he's thinking to himself, he wants more than the life of nobility. And he says the attitudes of the noble are static. Like he's... I, I don't know if he's mouth if he's talking to himself or if that was a thought, but, uh, and then he also kind of reflects on this territory that he's in, and I mentioned this earlier, not seeing action for eight years and how inexperienced this captain that was riding along with Lorne is. Like nobody in this garrison has any idea of what what is going on. He's also reflecting upon what he saw in the inn, the Consulbury, as he he speculates that it's sorcery. As he's kind of deep in his thoughts, his horse is startled, or startles maybe not the wrong word, but like has a little bit of hesitation in its step. And we see this mysterious figure on the road. And this uh mysterious figure knows knows who he is because he addresses him by rank and maybe I guess he could see his uniform but uh, you know you can see that this clearly catches Ganos off, off guard because he asks if he has any business with him he's also got his you know his sword out of his scabbard <laughs> yeah he's ready to throw down right <laughs> but we find out that uh, this guy's name is Topper and that Ganoz at least is familiar with the name. And Topper says, well, you should. I am he. Which really gave me like Obi-Wan Kenobi vibes. Or like uh, the the Matthias in Redwall. I am, I am, that is. Is really Martin the Warrior. I did not remember that. That's going way back. It's only because I just read Redwall. But it's, it's all good. It's either here or there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but did you catch the reason why he knows, like, Para- or Ganoz knows Topper's name? I am not sure. Maybe not. He killed the royal line in Unta. And I think he goes on to say, like, first cousins, second oh, cousins, right. third cousins. Yeah. Like, he's really explaining, like, and seems proud of the fact that he killed an entire line of royalty in Unta, which if I'm not correct in, or if I'm not mistaken, is, isn't that, isn't that Gano's hometown? I think that's where he was from, yeah. So, okay, so there, that makes sense. I didn't put that together till now. That's why he knows who this topper is. But yeah, and then he really gets into like, it's almost like a, you know, an Alice in Wonderland type thing. You know, the rabbit, you know, it's got to go, go, go. But, uh, you know, we got to get back to, um, who do you want to go take him to? The Empress? Lorne. But he's like, well, we, we got to do this. We got to go right now, but not until not until we have something to drink. Not until we talk. Right. But we got to go now. <laughs> yeah, because Lorne wants, Lorne is, is anticipating Gano's report from Jerome, the the marketing village that, he uncovered with all the horror. She is expecting him. However, Ganoz doesn't know that she's, I forget how many leagues away. And that's why she, Topper says that he was sent by Lorne to accompany him or escort him back to Lorne. Bring him back. Did you, uh, how did you take the way that he described these Warrens? Because you know, after, of course, you know, they, they make idle conversation uh, and then they, they share a, a glass of wine, was it? I, I forget what drink it was, but some type of drink and then some cheese. And then once they were done, Topper gets up and opens up this Warren right in the middle of the road and they they enter it. I really love the way that it was described. 
it almost just seemed like another like plane of existence right to me i i interpreted so the uh i thought it was funny where topper was just like you will have to get used to this oh also we didn't mention that topper is is a claw he's a member of the claw who is controlled by lacine so he's kind of another like second hand man to the empress he's a, a badass a war in the secret paths of sorcery Hood's breath, he sighed, fighting off a sudden chill. Within, he could see a grayish pathway, humped on either side by a low, mounded walls, and vaulted overhead by impenetrable ochre. I'm not sure how to say that word. Ochre-hued mist. The air swept past into the portal like a drawn breath, revealing the pathway to be of ash as invisible current stirred and raced spinning dust devils. It was just a very cool way of describing this, like, this magical tunnel. Yeah, a wormhole, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we get to, so Topper, they're making small conversation, and I feel like Topper gets angry about something that, that Paran or Ganoa says. Yeah, he calls him a fool. And ignorant. Or... Or, or Topper calls Ganoa's a fool. Oh, because, yeah, uh, Ganoa's asks that no god claims this warning. By this, you cheat the tolls, the gatekeepers, the guardians on unseen bridges, and all the others said to dwell in the warrens in service of their immortal masters. And then Topper, you know, pretty much just, like, scoffs and goes, you imagine the warrens as crowded as that? Well, the beliefs of the ignorant are ever entertaining. You shall be good company on this short journey, I think. So he's kind of making fun of Ganoa's. You know, taking, you know, little stabs at him. A little bit, yeah. I agree with you. And then, <laughs> kind of sounds like, from what I'm gathering, the end of um, end of this is Ganoa's is just, he's not having it. And Topper's kind of sensing maybe that he maybe said something wrong and goes, I've shamed you into silence then. I do apologize, Lieutenant, for mocking your ignorance. And then I thought this was kind of like a mic drop moment. It's a risk you'll have to live with, is what Gano says. <laughs> and Yeah, that was a good line. Yep, yep. And they essentially walk the rest of the way in in silence until they get to Unta where they, the portal opens up to Lucene's, Lucene's chamber, right? A convenience. Right. That that's what happened. Essentially, they get to chamber of Lucene. And she's just chilling on her throne of, of bones. So there's something there with her and bones. I don't exactly know what's going on. Uh, their fascination with bones. But as soon as they open the the warren to this chamber, Paran's or Ganoz's horse has a little bit of a a moment of hesitation or uh, bucking of some kind and, and ends up knocking Topper over as they, you know, go through this gateway. And Lucene makes some type of comment about, oh, you know, it, is the horse all good? Like, what's going on? And Ganoz makes a comment that, like, it's a very intelligent animal. My horse was reluctant to make the passage, Empress. And then he goes, unlike me, she's of a breed known for its intelligence. Please accept my humblest apologies. Like, that's, like, that's a good, that's a good recovery. It's a good way to recover. In front of your empress. Yeah, to you know, try to be a little humble. I like how they explain Lucien's uh, accent as drawled, because I just go back to the Sanchin in Wheel of Time, because he uses that word a lot. Like a Texas drawl? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's Texas, gross. Well, I think that's how Shan Chan were described. 
Oh, with a Texan drawl? Oh. Obviously not in the book, but I think that's what Robert Jordan had said. So after he recovers from the horse, um, he bows to his empress. And then Lucien says that you did not heed the commander's advice of seven years ago. And she goes, of course, he did not heed the advice given him either. I wonder what God tossed you two together on that parapet. So I feel like that, uh, you know, the, the other military person that was with him, you know, was probably that guy from seven years ago that told him to lay low and he did not listen. So there's something there. There's there's definitely something with him becoming, you know, uh, <laughs> some type of a military member, a lieutenant, right, in the you know, emperor empress's army, so to speak. It's a very short interaction. It's just they jump through the gate with the Warren, uh, the horse hits Topper, knocks him over, Lucien tells him or asks him, hey, you should have listened, should have listened to that commander seven years ago, makes that comment about them and the gods, and then quickly talks about the horse stumbling, if it was all right, or if there were issues. And then someone takes the horse by the reins, takes him to some some stable. And then Lucine tells Topper, hey, go take Go take Gano's to Lauren. She's upstairs. Topper gets kind of pissed off at Gano's and was just like, You fool! As, yeah, was... as the door closed from the chamber to essentially going upstairs. And, you know, the author explains Topper as dark with fury. What was that about a, a parapet? You've met her before when and then again another like mic drop moment uh Gnose is like since she dec- declined to explain i can only follow her example this would be the west tower then the tower of dust to the top floor the the adjunct o- awaits you in her chamber there's no other doors so you won't get lost just keep up until you reach the top so it's just he Gnose is i uh, I feel like he does. He obviously doesn't trust Topper. He doesn't trust him. Unknown reasons or unexplained reasons, but it doesn't sound like Gnose is really giving him the time of day. He's not telling him any more than he needs to. Which kind of goes back to a comment that Topper tells him earlier when they first met on the road. I don't know if you remember that because Gnoz asks him if he wants to hear about what he found and quickly changes his mind and Topper makes a comment like, oh, you're starting to you're starting to get it. Like the more the more information you withhold, the more the more hoarding. It's like hoarding of coin is what he said. I do remember that quote. Yeah, we missed it because I feel like as we talk, I remember things about the chapter that aren't necessarily in line with our recap. Uh, we're probably not going to be perfect, right? No, that's the point of a podcast. Just hang out, talk about perfections. It. Right. Those are the funnier moments. He gets to the top of the stairs, you know, knocks on the door, and Lorne is getting dressed. Gnose has a little bit of a moment of embarrassment, and Lauren is just like, I don't care. Look. <laughs> Let's just get this shit done. Right. So they talk a little bit, um, and I feel like that Gnose must be in on what happened, or he's just, uh, maybe he's admitting that he doesn't really know what's going on because, you know, whatever they're, either whatever they're looking for, the trail's been covered too well. Um, or they, in fact, covered the trail, so it's going to be difficult for somebody to follow them. Right, yeah, he's essentially giving him his or her report 
from what he found in Jaram. And I like the way that he goes. He says, The trail's been thoroughly obscured, adjunct. The only people left in Jaram aren't likely to talk. And then she Unless says... she were to send a necromancer. Right. So, again, there's more of this magic, sorcery. I'm really curious as to see where they go with necromancing, because it, it has to be a thing with how much it's been mentioned in this chapter. Well, I'm sure we'll see some. Yeah, definitely. And then, I, I again, very short, very short interaction to or not Topper. Uh, Ganoz essentially gives Lorne his report. He talks about his speculations as well about what he thinks took place in the inn as well as the the field of dead soldiers and horses and Lauren essentially just says you're not to tell anybody about what happened you need to keep it on the down low also you're being reassigned so you need to go hang out with your family for a couple of days yeah i feel like these last couple pages it's you know, there's not a ton of stuff that not a ton of action. It's just here. really just like set up for, I would assume, some relationships in the next chapters. Right. We run into his sister. Um, they have a short conversation. We also meet Gamut about his reassignment. Yes, we also meet Gamut, who is uh, very old. Uh, Gano's father's servant. He kind of like walks him through. Well, I guess the you know his homecoming is is described as familiar to him as he's walking in. He's easily able to find his home. He knocks on the door. Gamut lets him in. They have a very quick conversation of like, "Hey, I don't recognize you, but you recognize me by all of the." self-portraits that were painted of Gano's around his home. So Gamut introduces himself. Uh, Gano's is, is like, hey, are you are you a soldier? Like, what's up? Do you have some type of history? And Gamut beats around the bush, doesn't give him any answers on that. Kind of keeps like changing the subject. And eventually ends by saying, hey, your sister's here. Uh, She's waiting for you. I'm not sure where they ended up being. I want to say like some type of table. Feast hall and a dining table. And that's where they have an interaction with his sister, Tavor, who is one year younger about his his leaving and coming back. And I think she asks if he's been promoted and that, oh, reassigned is what Perrin said, or Paran said. And he makes this comment, again, going back to, to, you know, maybe some of the sneakiness of nobility. His sister Tavor makes a comment, to hear, we would have heard. And then he intrinsically has a thought that goes, ah, yes, you would have, wouldn't you? All the sly whisperings among the connected families. So he just, he pretty much just tells her, it it was unplanned, which very much was but I think I understand per, or Gano Peran's reason for joining the military he wants as he's walking through you know his hometown going to his home he is he wants to go back to the sword is what he's kind of his internal dialogue is telling him and in his conversation with his sister, I think that Gano's father is upset because he was supposed to rule the household and him leaving for the military now left that duty on his one year younger sister. And now their excuse me, now their father he's getting old and sickly and not doing as well. Yeah. She even makes the comment, managing this family's position is no longer your responsibility, brother. So I, when I read that, I you know, I read it like with a little bit of disdain, 
Like, does Tavor, like, how does, how is she seeing her brother at this moment? Is she happy or excited? Because when Gano is asked about his younger, younger sister, uh, Tavor responds with, oh, yeah, she doesn't even know you're here. She's off studying. She's going to be really bummed when she finds out that you're here, but leaving again. Exactly. So I'm not exactly sure what is in store with that relationship, but it doesn't seem, she doesn't seem thrilled that he's there or that he's back. Or maybe it's just the fact that he's going to be leaving again and not staying. That too. But I feel like there's, there's definitely some, some unanswered questions, some unresolved animosity between at least Gano's, his father, potentially his mom, and then his his younger sister. Yeah, we'll just have to see where that leads. If it I mean, even comes up again, we don't know. It just might be, you know, that might be it. We might never hear from her again. Right, the next chapter could be him on his way out. You know? But I think there's there's definitely something there that hopefully will get explored because very much like what you said, you know, last episode, being able to read some of the interactions between characters is is just as, you know, as uh, enthralling and enriching as reading something about the environment or a well-descripted battle scene. For sure. So anything else you want to add? I, I mean, that kind of brings us to the end of the first chapter here. Uh, no, I, I've gone through my entire list of notes here. It was just, it was a good chapter. Everything tied together. Everything made sense. I'm not left questioning. I'm not left questioning big things. Like, I don't feel like I didn't get it you know like there's definitely a lot of mystery there's definitely a lot of what ifs there's definitely a lot of like theories that i have going in my head but i'm not i'm not questioning what i feel the author is trying to convey no so far it's all it's all been pretty straightforward and i mean we have a couple small theories that we'll have to see how they play out but We've got another, I don't know, 30, 40 ish pages to read here for chapter two. And we'll see what happens next. It is super hard for me to like not read ahead. All I want to do is just, just keep reading. <laughs> it's so hard to just stop and just go back and reread it and try to get a better picture on what's being described. I think I read the first perspective like four times. I got through, I, I read it once fully, and then I got about halfway through it a second time. I mean, that's a long chapter, but, but, you know, after reading, after reading some of the chapters in A Wheel of Time, like, it's not, I used to freak out over 40, 40 page chapters, but now I don't. It's just, whatever. Things, yeah, things have, you know, they're, they're not dragging by, it's, you know, it's keeping, keeping you engaged and ready to turn the page it's it's not a slog by any means definitely not but yeah i guess we can uh we could wrap it up but again i feel like i've gotten everything off everything off that i wanted to get off all my questions talked about insights yeah theories it's all good yeah i don't think i've got any lingering thoughts um on this so yeah, let us know what you think. We do have a Facebook page set up now. It's uh, Derek and Justin's Epic Quest. If you search for us, you can find us and like that. And that would be a great help. Um, Justin's got an Instagram set up. I know he was talking about sketching uh, some things out as he reads and and posting those i don't know if you've gotten to any of that yet or not but it's trash it's garbage it's it's not trash it's uh um, a, yeah it's been a while since i've been done some figure drawing so but i'll post them just because what the hell 
you, you, yeah, you may as well. Um, I will make a Twitter account here sometime soon and get that going. And then if you want to send us an email, you can email us at dnj uh, epicquest dot, at gmail.com. You can also find our podcast on iTunes as well as Anchor and Spotify. Give us a listen. Check it out. Let us know what you think. And I'm, I'm sure we'll try to expand out into more spaces, but that is where we are right now. Awesome, man. Well, hey, great episode. Yeah, it was good talking to you, and uh, we'll shoot again for next week. Sounds good, man. Later. Take it easy.